What's up, guys? Hopefully you know me. I am Zap, the program manager of Renew Nashville and membership at the Entrepreneur Center. I'm so excited. Uh, this CEO story is really in a series of folks coming in to talk up, talk to the Renew Nashville audience about their COVID experience. And seriously, Angela, I think really has one of the most interesting, innovative, inspiring stories of all the folks that I talk to. I'm like excited to hear it in its like full form today. Uh, this woman is a hustler uh, and she's making it happen. Seriously, you are. Uh, so I'm so excited that she's come here to share her story. The hardest thing about COVID uh, is that with these virtual events, there's really no round of applause, but for just a moment, let's all pretend that we're all, I know the EC audience is enthusiastic. Oh, thank you for those claps, you guys. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so uh, thankful to have Angela here. Anyways, Angela, I'll hand things off to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to chat with you guys today. And let me share my screen. All right. So it's weird to kind of talk about myself and like what we've been doing, but I still want to share a few tips with you guys on how we have pivoted and the most important thing is how we have communicated with our clients, because that was the number one thing my previous life, pre-COVID, uh, was events. And I've been doing events for almost 20 years. And we actually had a five-year plan to retire out of events to start doing more productivity. And so for us, we were on the downswing of doing over 250 events and weddings and luxury weddings on private islands for, uh, this was like the 20th year. And so for us, it was kind of a perfect storm, but we did still have some events on the books and we still had lots of speaking engagements and meetings so when COVID hit in March, I was in Vegas speaking and I thought it was, I honestly, y'all, I didn't have TV or cable before all this started and I very much lived in my bubble and I very much lived in my hole and I was really all about focus and I got done with my presentation at this conference in Vegas and I was sitting at an Italian restaurant at one of the casinos with some friends and this guy was like, holy shit the NBA just shut down their schedule. And, you know, I don't watch sports and I'm like, oh, I guess that's kind of a big deal. And then my mom texted me and she's like, you have to get on a plane. They're about to shut down all the airports. And I'm like, okay, what the F is going on? Like something must be really wrong. And she wasn't really overreacting. So I did hop on a plane and took the red eye and came home. And over the next 48 hours, um, reality started to set in, which was all of our events that we had had were going to obviously need to be moved or canceled. And so I did have a little leak in my back pocket because the medical director for COVID that the mayor and governor appointed, Amir Jahangir, was actually my groom a couple of years ago. And so when all the buzz was coming out on TV, I'm like, hey, Alex, is this like a real problem? And he's like, girl, shut it down. <laughs> and so I knew that it was going to be bad. And over the next 48 hours from there, we lost over $620,000 in revenue. And so luckily for me, I never put all my eggs in one basket. And I know in entrepreneurship, they tell us to focus, 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 which I was focused. And we did have 80% of our revenue coming from live events. But luckily, I had suffered some, I would say, small tragedies in my career over the past two decades of being an entrepreneur, I don't see them as being a bad thing. I always see it as opportunities. And so about five years ago, my dad got throat cancer. My sister got ALS in the same month. And so I really had to take a step back and, and really pay attention at what was I doing with my time and how was I going to help my family and help my sister who has four kids 
um, and really move forward. And thankfully, I had a good team. I had a great foundation in the events industry. And my dad kept saying to me, you know, time is precious. And I was like, time is money, time is money. And he's like, no, honey, you don't understand. Like time is precious and you can never buy it back. So I want you to really think about how you're going to move forward with everything. And now, again, this was five years ago. And even before that happened to me, I want to share a little bit with you guys about my why. And so I went to school to be a psychologist and I was doing my practicums, my internships in a mental hospital in Florida. And I was one week from graduation. And while I really loved uh, helping people, I did not love working in a mental hospital and I knew I couldn't do it. And so my computer crashed and this was <laughs> my really old computer and I had gotten a virus and all of my details from all of my patients for six months, it was on my computer. And so I took my tower to the computer doctor and he said, honey, did you not back up on a floppy drive? And I'm like, what the hell is a floppy drive? And I learned real quick what a floppy drive was, but I still lost everything. And so I almost didn't graduate. And that set me on the path of becoming the biggest technology geek that you will ever meet because I never wanted to feel that empty again. I lost all my emails, all my pictures. And I thought my life was so important back then, but like it really wasn't. But now looking back, God was setting me up in a really good way because a week later, my car got broken into and my purse got stolen. I didn't care about my purse. I didn't care about anything but my planner, my paper planner that had my monogram initials on it that my parents got me for like a going away present from graduation. And I felt like my life had been stripped away from me because I, I'm OCD, like I wrote everything down. And so, you know, they say when it rains, it pours. And so that's when I learned how to start managing an online calendar. So I share these things with you because some people would say, oh my God, you have bad luck and all these bad things happen to me. And I've learned to reframe and pivot and understand like everything happens for a reason. I don't always know why it's happening to me then. But as I get older and more experienced in life, all these things start to make sense. So in 2010, our town flooded in Nashville. And this is I-24. We had eight displaced events, not just events, they were weddings, which is an emotional roller coaster <laughs> for a lot of our clients. And it was a nightmare. I was actually asking God, like, why are you doing this to me? Because this was the year that I stepped out of healthcare 100%. And I decided to actually take a leap of faith and just focus on a business, focus on running weddings and events. However, the important thing here to know is when I was in healthcare, the government mandated EMR, which is electronic medical records. So remember what happened to me here? I knew how to be paperless. I knew how to use the cloud. So I started to help a lot of the hospitals train their physicians and their nurses on how to go paperless and how to put all of their documents in the cloud for EMR. So when the flood rolled around, we were always paperless. Every company... And I kept telling it, Debbie probably <laughs> remembers this. I kept telling all my friends in the event industry, I'm like, you've got to use the cloud. You've got to be paperless. You've got to use the cloud. And no one would listen to me. No one until this happened, until the flood happened. And then I started teaching free classes and I really was like, okay, maybe I should start this other business on teaching people how to put all their stuff in the cloud and being more productive with their time. So that's what I did. It's always been a side hustle. It was never, it, and it was really for fun. It was never like going to be this full-fledged company. Now, this was a decade ago, 10 years ago, okay? So here I am a decade later creating content because why not? I mean, I had the time. And so I'm sitting here looking at my computer and I'm like, okay, what the hell are we going to do? And this was like the first week of April. And so I started to create content and started to put content out there on a consistent basis to let people know we're not going anywhere and we're going to pivot and we're going to do something. So I just want to share with you what I personally did. I shut out all the distractions literally for about two weeks. And we had so many clients coming to me. And again, I have a great team saying like, what should we do? What should we do? And so I told my team, I'm like, okay, we're going to have to slow roll some stuff. But right now I have no answers. I don't know what to do, but people are going to have to give me just a few weeks and then I'll come up with something. 
everyone was looking to me as the planner, as the innovator. And I never stopped to think like, oh my gosh, this is actually kind of stressful that all this is on my shoulders. I wasn't worried about it because this is the third recession that our events company has gone through. We went through the crisis when everything, all the stock markets, we had clients losing millions of dollars in the stock market when they were supposed to be putting it into their luxury wedding. And so I've already been through this. And so, and I'm thankful for that as well. So I knew that I had to do something about it and, and come up with something. So I literally went black on social media. In fact, I had people reach, they're like, are you okay? Uh, we haven't seen you like on your stories or I'm like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I just got to figure some shit out. Okay. And I'm used to being busy. Like this is a screenshot. Yes. It's glory for confidentiality, but I'm very used to being busy. My calendar 10, 15 hours a day. Like I'm usually in meetings. I'm doing client work. Like I was a little bit lost. Like I'm not even going to lie. So I got a new whiteboard <laughs> and I started to strategize and, and use paper again, because I'm like, I got to lay some stuff out here. And so that's what I started to do. So I started to lay out all of our events, every, all the clients we were working with. And I went back to my foundation, the whole foundation of when I worked in the, the mental hospital, we did all these psychology assessments on all of our patients. And there was one assessment that people actually opened up to me and they actually started to listen. Now I was a kid. So if I was like in a mental hospital talking to like a 19 year old, I mean, come on. I like roll my eyes at myself now, but I'm like, why don't they respect me? Why won't they listen to me? And, but this was the only psychology methodology that actually worked. And so it taught me at a very young age about people how to observe, how to be a good listener, and how to actually understand what people are revealing, because it's never about me. It's much deeper than me. I was just the sounding board for people. And so I would listen and I would say, you know, let me get back to you. But I do want to share with you guys, like if you're not using a psychology methodology within your companies or within your startups, it's again, the foundation. So I went back to the foundation. I'm like, I know true colors, like the back of my hand. I went, I wrote a book in 2012 for the wedding industry about how to use true colors and communicate with people. And then they tried to sue me, but I didn't know they were a book company. <laughs> I was just trying to help people. I wasn't even trying to make money off of it. And, but then that turned into my attorney working something out with them, what, which turned into becoming a certified facilitator. So I did that in 2013. I was like super mad that I had to go off to their little university for a week, but it actually ended up being amazing. And I love it. And we use this methodology in everything we do. We use it with our clients. We use it with our vendors. Now we do like a five minute version so I'm going to show you guys what, what that is real quick. And then I'm going to go through reframing and talk through with you guys how I knew how to handle, very fragile, <laughs> handle our clients and the way I needed to communicate with them and the solutions that I needed to bring to them for COVID. So this is just a funny cartoon that you, you'll get it. So like the guys on the phone, my computer doesn't work. The hard drive crashed. What do I do? And then the person on the phone's like, well, did you back up? Now we know what that means. Like we know that means, okay. In you know, the nineties floppy drives, then jump drives, then hard drives. Now the cloud, now Dropbox, box.com. Like there's so many ways, but there are still people in the world that do not understand what I'm talking about when I'm talking about techno technology, especially on the phone. And so this poor guy is like backing up and he's like, why is it going to blow up? Which just makes me laugh because sometimes with my clients, this is how, it, how I feel. I'm saying one thing, but they're thinking something totally different. And so we really have to make sure that we are clearly communicating, especially when we're offering solutions in the middle of a crisis. And so going back to our four pillars, and again, this is an internal thing, but we have four pillars to GSD, which my company is called GSD Creative, which is get shit done. So we're always GSDing. We like to have fun, but sometimes we got to like get down to business. And so our four pillars internally are people, process, which is paperless processes, 
productivity. We always want to be productive and that is with software automation. And then we always need to look and make sure that we're actually making a profit. When we're saying yes to things, is it going to make a profit? I know my hard cost. I know how much it costs me daily to run a company, a completely paperless company. And so you've got to understand what is your foundation and don't veer from that. Now, I'm about to jump into how we started to pivot, but I never veered from the foundation. It's taken, it took a whole decade to get here and a lot of EO mentors. So I'm not even going to pretend I came up with this shit on my own because I didn't. <laughs> I had a lot of help. And so I want to show you guys the cards that we use and they look a little hokey pokey, but it works. I promise it works. And so starting off with people. So there's four types of personalities within True Colors. And so as you guys look at these colors and look at the cards and don't worry so much about the color. I know that if you don't like UT, it's not about that. It's not about, well, I don't like the, the color orange because the balls suck. I went to UT. So Peyton Manny was there when I was there. We were really good. We always won, <laughs> but it's not like that anymore. But when you look at these pictures, what are you drawn to? And so in the orange, you're seeing fun, excitement, definitely uh, de devil, devilish, like, hey, I'll go climb a mountain and I'll go snowboarding, like just risk taking. And then you've got the golds, which they're very planned and they like repetition. And my goodness, if they have never been in a situation where they cannot be flexible, um, it's hard. It's very, very hard. And it takes a lot of patience to get them to understand that the world is not coming to an end. We just need to be a little bit flexible. And then the other two colors are blue and green. So blue people really value uniqueness, harmony, relationships. It is all about people and relationships where the greens they couldn't be any the furthest from being different. The greens, they're more interested in being alone. They're introverted. They work alone. They love research. They, they love analytics. The greens in COVID, this is like their dream. Like they are on cloud nine because people leave them alone and they can do what they do and love it. The blues during COVID, they're struggling. They are depressed. They are lonely. They miss the whole work atmosphere. And so by me colorizing all of our clients and knowing our clients, this helps us reframe and come up with a solution during a tragedy. And so going back to oranges, I'm very orange. A lot of entrepreneurs are orange, orange or green. And oranges are flexible. We're like, you know what? We got this. Well, we don't, we, we don't, but we'll figure it out. Like it's okay. And then the golds, they're having a really hard time with it too, because they're having to get back into a routine and they're not productive until they find out what type of routine are they going to have. And so I've got some more examples down in, in just a few minutes, but I do want to say it takes all four colors to make a company go round. If you don't have all four colors in a company, so I know I keep going back and forth between like companies and clients, but you guys are in companies and your startups. So I do want to tell you for your team, again, oranges on your team, they might need a little bit of direction, but it's like, hey, go, go get some sales, go cold call, go zoom. And you know, they'll be like, okay, that's cool. No big deal. I can't do it in person. I'll just zoom. Just give me the tools so I can be successful. Again, the gold people you, you got as a leader, you have to help them find a, a daily rhythm that's going to work for them and their family. The blues, we Marco Polo every day. It's a, it's a free video texting app. And I'm like, Hey, what's up? How are you? Just wanted to say like, thinking of you, hope you're doing okay. That's not me. I'm not a mushy girl, but I know that my blues need that. They, they need a cheerleader behind them knowing that like, Hey, we're cheering you on. It's, it's going to be okay. And we're here for you. And the greens are fine. Like I don't need to Marco Polo them. It's just like, give me your reports when, whenever you're done with it. And here's the deadline. So the reality for all these different types of colors, and if you guys want me to share these with you, I'm not going to like read everything on the screen, but again, like the number one thing is reframing if you're not this color. So for the people who are not orange, which most of our clients are orange because I've been at this for a while and you bring in what you put out and I'm very orange. I put it out. So I bring it back in. 
but not on my team. <laughs> we're, we're strategically completely different colors and true colors for a reason. So I don't have blind spots. And so reframing for our clients, I knew the oranges were going to be fine. And I knew that they were just going to trust me. But if I stopped and thought about it for a minute, I was like, oh God, this is kind of really stressful because they were just looking to me. Most of the oranges that we work with, they're investors, they have multiple projects going on. And so I'll share with you guys like how we pivoted. The golds, we don't, we, we have a few gold clients and the golds, I had to take a lot of time with them. And some of the events that they had that they did not want to move to digital events, I had to have a heart to heart and say, listen, I know you're, you want to be in control. Golds are very controlling. They get labeled as bridezillas. I don't see it that way at all. I see them. Uh, I, I appreciate people who are controlling because they want to make sure that the customer service and the outcome is perfect and their way is perfect. Everything is black and white. There is no gray <laughs> in golds. And so from a work perspective, it's great. But when it comes to flexibility, it was very difficult. And so some of our clients, we, I, I just flat out said, listen, I don't know what's going to happen, but we are not doing any more events in person in the year 2020 per our attorney. <laughs> so we are going to move them until 2021. I don't know when we will start planning them, but I'm not going to waste time and effort and stress everybody out. We're going to wait until we have some type of direction from the health department, the CDC guidelines, from really like I, I had to get basic cable so I can like watch every day Amir and the mayor and the governor like come on and like tell us what was going on. And you know, everything they say on TV, you know, there's more going on behind the scenes, right? I mean, hopefully you guys know that. But in working with clients in the public eye, and it's like things come out in the magazines and things come out on TV, and then you know what is really going on. And it's like, oh, well, that's not really the whole story, but that's fine, whatever. And so I was getting a little bit there. I had, you know, some sources that I was getting more information from, and we just decided to put it out there and say, we're not doing any more in 2020. So getting a goal to understand that when they're not in control, we've had a few people you know, break down and cry and scream and cuss and get angry. In fact, it happened yesterday with a client and I just listened and you have to just listen. And I'm like, do you want me to try to solve it right now? Or do you just want to want to vent and you want me to listen? And she's like, I, I just, I, I, I I'm going crazy over here. I'm like, you got to calm down. You got to take a few breaths. Now, most of my clients are much younger than I am. And so in, in life experience, you learn to have more patience. And then after two hours of going through some things, I'm like, it's going to be fine. You're still going to be able to do some of these things. It's not on your time frame. And I'm sorry, you and I are not in control. So let's focus on things we can control rather than the things we can't control. So it's a matter of going through and really using this psychology <laughs> comes in handy every single day. So for blues, again, with COVID and we don't have a lot of high blue clients, but my, my, my family, oh my gosh, my mother is very blue. And so she still works and she has been very lonely. And she's like, you're going to call me or Marco Polo me or FaceTime or come by because she lives 30 minutes down the road. And I'm like, I'm still working, but yes, I will check on, check on you. And again, you have to take a step back and realize like I'm the rock and you as a leader, I bet you that you guys are the rock too. And I, again, I never let my brain even go to that depressing place of God, I why does everybody call on me? And but, but that's what God put me here for. Like it's a purpose and it gives us as leaders more, even more of a purpose to want to do better and want to help these people. At least I do. And so the, the blues have been more, it's, it's been more my family than my clients and then reframing, um, for greens. So again, greens are fine. They're introverts. They're, they're fine at home. They're fine working alone. And with the greens, it's more about the data and the research. And they, I, I don't, I think they would be fine if we never went back to, to work normally. 
And so going into the reality of some of the clients and some of the things that we were working on, I'm going to share with you all like how we pivoted on some things. So this was a keto physician group for the keto community. We had about, I would say if we did it in person, about 500 people. And so these clients are orange and they're like, Hey, we want to do it online. We don't want to just cancel it. We have thousands of people in our community that need us right now because they're on a journey to getting more healthy. I don't know how familiar you are with keto, but I didn't know anything about it. And I, I holy shit, I've learned so much. And we ended up, and I'm like, okay, I don't know how, what we're going to do. Now I have done a few digital events. I was, I've been more on the digital side with Oculus, with the VR, the virtual reality glasses and creating virtual opportunities to send goggles off to people and sell, basically sell a site or an island unseen. So this was not foreign to me being virtual. We've been operating off of Zoom for about five and a half years now. That's for me going and speaking literally all around the world and then just staying connected with people on social media. So this didn't freak me out, but I'd never run a, a completely 3D digital conference before. And so I'm like, uh, I'll figure it out. So I interviewed 13 platforms and I really tapped into my network in EO. I'm on a Slack channel with people all around the world. And, and again, EO really helped when it came to, to some of this stuff. It's like, just ask for help. Like, don't be that person that has an ego where you're like, I'm going to figure it out myself because I know it all. It's like, you got to put that aside, especially when stuff like this happens. And so I want to show you guys, like what we came up with was, um, was absolutely crazy. So we ended up building building this out and they were worried about how are we going to sell tickets? I'm like, eh, we got Stripe, we got lead pages, we're fine. And then they're like, but the sponsors aren't going to give us any money. And I'm like, no, actually this is way better because we can put pixel codes, we can track, we can retarget. It actually was an amazing, amazing event. And so, but in the background, shit was not perfect at all. And on the front end, though, it looked great. What we learned about this digital event, though, pr they're primary, primarily they have, I would say 2,000 of the tickets that were sold. They sold 3,000 tickets. We capped it. We capped it at 2,000. And then we still had like another month. And then we capped it at 3,000. So we learned the more people that are using like bandwidth and, you know, and all the internet stuff in the digital world that you have to like pay for space is the best way I can really explain it. And so it's like paying for a seat, but like being able to stream stuff to people. And so then we opened it up because you could sell tickets in a thousand, um, 500 increments. So then we opened it up 2,500 and then that sold out. And then, and it was super affordable. Like the guy that put it on, he's like, Oh, I want to do it for free. I'm like, Ken, uh, I don't think you want, do you want to pull money out of your own pocket during a pandemic? Because, you know, you're going to spend about $150,000 on food and beverage at like the, at an Omni, but we're going to need that money to build off this platform. It is not inexpensive. And so he, they, they got sponsors and then he's like, okay, well, let's sell the tickets for $39. This was a three day event, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all day, 12 hour days, lots of speakers. And so the price was insanely low, but these people and the way that their life was changing with the way they were eating healthy and they were submitting videos. And I got to see all the before and after, and I'm the one back there editing videos. And I'm like crying because these women are like, uh, my husband died of a heart attack because we didn't know how to eat healthy. And so now I've done keto and look at me at 272 pounds and look at me at 130 pounds now. And I know it's a very controversial diet, but let me tell you is it gives you a lot of motivation to not eat carbs. <laughs> and so I ended up learning so much, but going back to the sponsors, they still gave money. And I, I definitely overpromised and over delivered. And so I'm like, I can track this. I can get you this. We'll give you the list. We can do all of this. And thankfully I knew how to do all of that because we do it with my own companies. And so it was just taking my knowledge of what we already do for myself and putting it into, putting it into action with other clients. And so it ended up being 
wildly successful. What we learned from it though, most of their audience is over 60 years old. Now there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but people over 60 into the technology world, um, they need a little bit of guidance. And so when I hired multiple people to run the chat support, they weren't prepared. They were not prepared. And, and I didn't know that we were going to have integration problems and pop-up problems and firewall problems. And, you know, we, we stayed up almost for three days straight, no sleep, and we figured it out. And so then after that, I went back to the platform six connects and I'm like, Hey, do you guys not like have like a troubleshooting guide? Because this was insane. I, I mean, I was pissed. I'm like, why didn't you tell me this? And then they wanted to put it off on a third party. I'm like, no, 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 listen, if you're going to integrate with thing, with other uh, platforms, you have to own it. This is what I learned working in the luxury market is when I sell something and I refer a vendor, it is me. If you don't deliver, it's back on me. And so I'm like, let's work through this and come up with some type of a manual that you can send out to people. And apparently they're like, well, we've never worked with anybody like you before that kind of knows <laughs> the behind the scenes. So I've ended up like helping that company understand, like, let's bring some things in house and like, let's not do this again. This company has been around 11 years, but guess what? They just boomed because of COVID and they didn't have enough people. And so, you know, again, I would never say that public publicly to the people, the people that got on the platform and, and got to go through it. They loved it. It was, they loved it. They were able to chat by, um, their dietary restrictions and their health problems. And it was amazing. So then we ended up building a video funnel out of that. I edited everything and now they're able to sell it online. So that's great. And um, again, nothing's ever easy when you do it the first time, but figuring it out is, um, has actually been fun and challenging. The next client, this is Columbia Spring. It's a venue. It's a, over 200 acres that was going, is, it's an investor that was going to have, I mean, Columbia's booming right now, if y'all don't know. And um, so we were going to help them strategize for about a year and then do a grand opening and have all these great events. Well, then COVID hit. So the investor, he's an, he's an agricultural attorney by trade. And so he's like, Hey, let's put this on hold and can let's like get some cameras and, uh, get some 5g out here in Columbia so that we can live stream and do slow-mo TV for all of these exotic animals that I'm going to be bringing to this farm. And he's basically redefining agriculture for the farming industry. And he's also, <laughs> we're also um, helping him start like investments for children, city kids. So if you've never seen a cow in person, which this is a real thing, y'all, that um, these children can get investments in a cow and this family, they sell semen to uh, people all over the world to produce these cows that uh, produce this organic meat. I've learned more about dairy and meat in the last six months than I've ever learned in my entire life. And so like, I, I'm like, yeah, organic grass fed, that sounds good. And, but now like it's a whole different level. And so that has led me down the road of going to, um, these, these cattle places in Oklahoma and learning about cows and learning about the meat industry and the dairy industry. And so this is one of the horses. Um, I didn't know what a Clydesdale horse was, but apparently this is Danny and Danny like won all these awards. And so we started to use Danny to build up excitement and because we're still going to, he's still going to open the venue. It's just going to be a little bit delayed. So he purchases Clydesdale, brings it back, does this whole slow-mo thing from Oklahoma. It was like this big road trip. And y'all, I'd never been to a, a cattle um, where they're like, I can't even do it. But this man's talking so fast and they're selling all these cows for like 60 and $70,000. I'm like, this is insane. And no one was wearing, wearing a mask. It wasn't like COVID existed in that part of Oklahoma. And I was highly uncomfortable. And like, I didn't want to touch anything, but I learned a lot. 
And that is me in this um, stockyard. And I learned all about the stock market and how people make money investing in cows and selling the semen, which led us to putting in a proposal to help the dairy farmers. I don't, I, again, I, I don't watch TV. I don't get involved in all of this, but it's a big thing right now. There's a huge problem in the dairy industry where milk's being thrown out and, but, but it's all, it all comes down to marketing. That's what this all comes down to is almond milk and coconut milk. And I'm like, my whole family's lactose intolerant. I couldn't tell you the last time I had milk. I don't drink milk. I don't eat ice cream, but there's so many benefits to dairy, but the, the industry doesn't know how to market it correctly. And so again, taking what we do for my own company and writing copy based on the four personalities of true colors, we've been able to help this investor in this company in the dairy industry really understand how to customize the message, the way the farmers need to hear it, the way they need to pivot. So going back to that foundation, we've been able to pivot and I, y'all, I know this, this shit is crazy. Um, also we, I was working on doing an event for a book launch, the good line. It's the largest cocaine bust in Nashville. It's a wiretap case. And instead of doing an event, we ended up doing a strategy for a, a trailer, like a book trailer. So it was really fun to pivot all these different things that we had coming up. And I'm like, Hey, we can do a video. We can do this. We can run ads to it. We can do a campaign for that. And I'm like, overnight, I'm like, did we just become like a marketing agency or something, <laughs> which is not what I signed up to do at all, but it really comes down more to strategy, how to be strategic when you have something that you're planning and it's not going to go the way you wanted it to go and you're out of control, like use your knowledge and what you've already been doing or use your resources and things that you've already been doing. So again, like I'm very into um, technology and looking ahead. And so we do a lot of work with Oculus. This is one of the private islands called Jumbie Bay in Antigua, where we went and built some floor plans. And it, we had all kinds of stuff coming down the pike this year with the VR glasses and with some sales teams. And that turned into a lot of Zooms, which this is how we started. And then more people started to get on but I still traveled. <laughs> so I had a whole plane to myself. Um, but I still went there and like did some stuff for them. And this is before like all the stuff was shut down and my mother was so pissed. And I'm like, sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. And, but then, I mean, reality really started to set in for me when I was traveling out there to do some of that stuff. And it was so weird, y'all. It was like no people and, you know, all the work it first off it is hot as hell out in the Caribbean you know this and having to wear a mask and like everything it was just it wasn't the experience that I would want someone to go come on a vacation or come to an island and experience so again like I got back I'm like I, I can't do this right now like this is and also too, it's like putting myself at risk, which is putting my family at risk. Like I couldn't, I was like, I'm not going to see you for 14 days. Like I really put it and I put it on my calendar. So I went back again to our foundation of what do we know? We know that people don't know how to organize their technology. They don't know how to work software. This was actually a client's desktop, by the way. And when people come in and, and I see this, I'm like, oh, no, 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 we can't start planning anything until we fix your desktop, because I guarantee that this is not backed up. And if you spilt a beer or your coffee or your water and your computer died, you are going to freaking lose your mind. And so we went back to, okay, let's go back to technology where we can all be safe. And the number one thing that started to happen is people, I started to teach Zoom classes, like best practices, which to me, I'm like, my gosh, I could do that in my sleep. And the number one thing that I started to see in, in large companies is, oh my God, they don't secure their passwords. They use the same password for everything. I'm like, we got to stop this. So then we started, and my identity's been stolen a couple of years ago. Again, you learn from these things. I'm like, we've got to teach people how to work efficiently and how to have a process digitally in the cloud. We've got to teach them to encrypt their software and all the passwords for each and every platform that we used. And really I reached out to my clients and my, and most of our clients that we've done events for, they're all entrepreneurs. They all own companies. And so reaching out to them and saying like, Hey, 
clearly we're all, we're all going through this right now. So if we can help you pivot in any way, we can. And then I started to leverage some of our social platforms. So I've had a podcast for about five years and we really started to talk about different things on the podcast and we brought on different guests, which led to, which this is Joe up here in the corner. He um, has a tech company called Lovingly and he's been talking about launching a podcast for probably three years now. And so when I started talking on my podcast, like, Hey, if you want to start a podcast, like we're not a podcast company, but we know how to do it. We've been doing it for several years and we can monetize it and make money from it. And so people started to reach out and say, Hey, Ange, we have time now. So can you help us do this? And can you talk us through? And, and again, going back to the strategy of what we were already doing for our own brands and our own companies, and then reaching out to help others, because guess what? I'm not an expert at it, but I know how to do it and we know how to monetize it. And so why would I not help someone who knows nothing about it? So that's another income stream. And then we got real fun and we leveraged TikTok. I thought it was just like a bunch of kids dancing. And so, but when COVID started, which my nieces, which I homeschooled one of them pre-COVID because she wasn't making good decisions. And then the two younger, uh, two of my younger nieces, they started to do TikToks and dancing because um, they, I was a competitive gymnast and they're gymnasts where I used to do gymnastics. And so I just thought it was like a kid thing, right? So um, no. So then I was like, okay, well, I guess like I'd be scrolling on their account, like, cause I would approve the videos to go on their account. And then I started to see like marketing tips and productivity tips. And I'm like, Hmm, maybe I should do this. Well, so then I took two days and did a bunch of videos and started to post on TikTok and again, learning the strategy, which led to getting then TikTok came out with an ads platform and about a billion dollars went into this learn on TikTok hashtag for small business owners. And so when all this, oh, TikTok's going away, I'm like, yeah, ain't going nowhere. I don't know what all the problem is not going anywhere. A billion dollars just got sunk into it for small businesses in the United States. So there was all of that and people kept, they're like, oh my God, is TikTok going away? But I use TikTok to bribe my nieces. So I'm going to like go into some of that. So this is my 17, now 18 year old niece that I was homeschooling before. And then she was all excited about graduating. Well, again, COVID was kind of a perfect storm for us because we didn't want her to go back to school anyway um, between us. <laughs> And so, but then we ended up having like a little drive-by graduation party for her. I like took her and did like a little photo shoot, and like got her hair and makeup. And, you know, we still did it the COVID way, but I couldn't imagine if she like actually, um, you know, went to prom and like had all these other opportunities of like making bad decisions. We finally got her moved to college, thank God, which is good. And then these are my two younger nieces, which I'm like, okay, three hours of homeschool equals three dancing TikToks. And so while they would be dancing TikToks, and then I taught them, I'm like, we can make this a little business and a college fund for you all. Everyone thinks they're twins, they're 13 months apart. So we branded them as the Vickers twins. And so we started this whole little side business for the kids to start monetizing it. And like, now they understand consistency. They understand the algorithm. They, they know how to do hashtags. So of course, I'm going to like monetize the kids if I have to like be part of it. Otherwise, like I was going crazy. I'm like, you've got to shut up or like take, go outside with the dogs. Like I've got to do these Zooms. And so it really helped leverage the homeschooling and then bribing and doing dancing. But the thing is like, we never stopped learning ever. And so we still had an intern. This is Anna. This is Amanda. Um, she's my gold. She's the right hand in the company. And Anna was the neighbor of Andy Bailey, who is, was one of my very first EO mentors changed my life. And, um, she reached out and she's like, I know it's like COVID, but I still want to do an internship. And so how would that look? And, Andy's like, you know, just give her a chance. It's, we weren't going to take any interns. We usually take them every eight weeks. I'm like, not during COVID. I'm not getting sued. I'm not doing that. And I'm like, sure, we can try it, but you're going to sit on Zoom all day. So eight weeks afterwards, she like made a recap video. We put it up on YouTube and she's like, I never knew I could learn so much on Zoom, but this, we, we were together two times in person. One time we were able to go on like a two and a half hour venue trip 
And again, we were still safe. And then like, this was our, her last day. And so we were able to go to a little Mexican restaurant, which was so weird because it's like, there were like 10 tables in the whole restaurant. And, but she was like, thank you so much. Like you've made such a difference in my life, showing me like how you can still be a leader. You can be a woman, you can still do these things. But you, I just had to focus more on the consulting side and helping other businesses than actually doing events. And so I tell you this because don't slow your business down and growth just because we have a pandemic. Personally, the other few things is I've never cooked before, ever. Um, my mom was like a Betty Crocker, Crocker cook growing up, but I am around a lot of good food and tastings and chefs and I never cooked. My whole kitchen was all a design studio. And then I had to like buy some pans and pots off of Amazon. And I started to like, I became a member of Green Chef and like I started to learn and we did content around it. It was like a funny joke. And like those spices right there, um, that's for, from, from my ex-boyfriend. We have not been together for three years. And um, a friend of mine who was Zooming with me, she's like, okay, so I'm going to teach you this and this. Like, do you have any spices? I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you know, like in a spice rack. And I, I like open my spice rack. And it's linen samples. And so I'm like, oh, but wait, in the back, I do have these three things. And then I pull them out and she goes, what are the expiration dates? I'm like, I don't know. And they had been expired for almost three years. And I was like, oh, maybe I should throw that away. But we like make fun of myself. We just make fun because this is real shit. Like we had to homeschool kids. We had to learn things that we've never learned how to do. And so I I'm never embarrassed to like tell people because I, I was busy growing an empire and like running a company, like cooking was the furthest thing from my mind and we can't be good at everything. So as we wrap up, the top three takeaways that I hope that you got from this is that number one, relationships matter. And the way that we have pivoted and the way that we have stayed profitable as a company, going back to our fund foundation, is that without a good reputation and without relationships, I don't know where we would be. And so maintaining those good relationships and asking for help, again, you, you got to put your ego aside. And, and a lot of times, like, I'm like, oh, I'll just figure this out on my own. That went out the window a really long time ago, especially when I got involved with the Entrepreneur Center and I got involved with the Entrepreneur Organization and I started to surround myself with the right people it's okay to go out and ask for help because the worst people can do is tell you no or they don't have time right now. And we have been able to help so many people just because I asked. And if you ask, people will listen and you don't have to know it all. And the last thing that I'll say is passion. When you're passionate about something, it's going to support the profit. And so not that I was born to love technology, but because of the things that happened to me very early on that I shared with you in the beginning, that has made me very passionate about technology, about being paperless, about organizing your passwords, all these things that until it happens to you, you don't know how it feels. And sometimes when I talk about it, people will say, you look mad. Or I'm like, no, 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 don't confuse mad with passion. I'm Yes, mad that you go to sleep at night and your computer isn't in the cloud. Like, how can you sleep at night? But you can't leave here today saying you don't know now because you know now. But when you're passionate about something, because I never want anybody to go through what I went through and the emptiness and the pain, it sucks. It absolutely sucks losing all of your business files and your personal files. And so even if you're in a startup and you're running a company, and they say, focus, 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 you always have something that you're good at, or you always have an opportunity or something that's happened to you personally that drives that passion. And so it's okay, especially during a pandemic, to help others around you to drive profit to keep going. Because what else am I going to do? I mean, I'm unemployable. I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years. Like, why stop now? So without rain, nothing grows. And frankly, I was getting a little bored in the events that you can only do so many luxury weddings on the same island in the same venue. We always worked at the Skirmahorn, which is a beautiful place. But there comes a point where you're bored. 
And so COVID has given us the, has given us the opportunity to slow down, reevaluate, get closer to our family and friends, the people who are always going to be there. Those are our roots and really take the time to understand, like, we need to be challenged for change. Otherwise, we're never going to grow. So you've got to learn to embrace the storms of your life. And here's a few resources. Our company website is gstcreative.com. And my podcast is Business Unveiled. We drop it every Tuesday. And then I have a YouTube channel, a new YouTube channel that we re that we started over from because the other one was so weddings heavy. And now I see the need and productivity so much more. And we're making more of an impact for businesses and entrepreneurs and leaders by teaching them how to be productive with technology. So thank you so much for your time. Hopefully you guys got good nuggets out of it. And then are there, if there's any questions, you guys can type it in the chat or I don't know how this works or unmute That's yourself. That's awesome. Where's the TikTok link? Oh, I, it's just under oh. my, uh, it's under <laughs> my name. It's, it's Angela Prophet, two Fs and two Ts, underscore is like my link. Yeah, go follow me on TikTok. I do, and, and honestly, y'all, the 15 second videos of, um, of short, sweet, and to the point, that's what our attention span is able to handle these days. And so doing those little productivity videos, it, it has helped so many people. Yesterday, I was on a call with someone and she, you know, got to know me a little bit. And she's like, I don't do TikTok. And I will say I went and watched your TikTok and I thought you were like on drugs or something because you talked like really, really fast like this. And then my boss told me that you were speeding it up. Why do you do that? And I'm like, because I wanted to get a 30 second tip and I could only do it in 15 seconds because our analytics tell us that 15 seconds is the best way to get a tip in. And you have to go back and watch it multiple times. And that's a strategy because that makes you get more views in the algorithm. She's like, oh, but I thought you really talked that fast. I just have to laugh at these things sometimes. Um, but yeah, what questions do you guys have? Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself or type it into the chat and I can read it. Hey, it's Debbie. Of course, Debbie has questions. Can you hear me? Of course. Yeah. Okay. So, hey, Angela, love you. And I, I, I you know that I'm a gold. So, um, yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. I've done this with Angela like three times. Yes. Um, but um, first of all, Angela, can we book you for office hours? The so Angela is not actually an EC advisor, so okay. that would probably have to happen offline. Oh, okay. I, I'm like, what? I'm like, I don't have office hours. <laughs> like, I work all the time. <laughs> Sorry, the Tuesday workshops are usually advisors who are available for office hours after the workshop. Gotcha. But... Okay. Gotcha. Well, I wanted to talk to you about some of your your virtual um, platform stuff because yeah, right now because we're going into that with um, Versator and yeah. I'd love to talk to you about like, I'm talking. sorry, son right next to me. Yes, yeah. you can have a piece of candy. Um, That's real, the struggle seriously, is real. Seriously, like, this struggle is definitely real having two kids at home. But um, yeah, I'll just, um, I'll, 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 I have your email address. I'll hook yeah. up with you after. Yeah, just reach out. We can talk offline. I'm Perfect. happy to help and share everything that we've been through. Yeah. Thank you. Angela, what do you see as the future of events in 2021? Like, what does your calendar look like? So we're actually not going to be doing a ton of events. And this is just my company personally, because that we've seen such a need for productivity. And this has been, again, like the perfect shit storm, but I'm still uh, very involved in the industry. And so, but what we're seeing for events is two things. Number one, there will be smaller, intimate in-person events, but obviously the whole germ thing and the, the distancing is, is real, but we will see people offering a hybrid. So they will be in person and it's kind of like the first 50 people to RSVP or, you know, if it's a wedding, probably your closest family and then people will be live streaming things. And I don't think that's ever going to go away. Like even when we find a vaccine and, you know, all this stuff, we look back two years later, I still think that it has brought an opportunity 
which we were doing this before COVID, but we were just doing it with like one person, like live streaming for like grandparents from, or from a parents in the hospital that were sick, that couldn't come to a wedding or an event. So I, I see the, these hybrid opportunities for in-person, which is also creating opportunities for people who before COVID, like they wouldn't have had the means or the funds to travel. So it's opening up our world for much more closer connection by offering things virtually, which I don't think is a bad thing. Again, I'm always looking at the good side of things. And so I think that that's going to be events for, you know, going forward forever. And the other thing, like you mentioned about catering is from, um, a sanitary world. We, we are looking at things very differently, which I think that is actually going to bring a lot of clean clarity to traveling with food and making sure that things are going to be much more safe to consume rather than not. And I really think it's going to dial things down and dial things back a little bit. I have noticed in some of the, my, I have a coaching group of wedding planners that, um, people aren't acting out as much. So when normally it's like this huge party and they're getting shit face drunk and then, you know, people do stupid things like people are actually being a little bit more respectful now, um, with all that's going on. So I think a lot of good is going to come out of it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Someone okay. had a question in the chat. If you had any advice of getting into productivity space. Yeah. So the, the first, the first, the way to get into it is do a strategy and put all your content together and then start dripping content every single day on platforms to establish yourself as an authority so that you know what you're talking about and then you can share it with your audience and start to build an audience around you being the expert and then i call it potty train your brain but potty train your audience's brain so that they come to you and you're constantly there to help them now this does come with checking your dms checking your linkedin messages and all of that and so there is a little bit of pivoting that we had to do to pull in all these messages so that we could provide good customer service. But that, especially during COVID, that's the first way is to really get a strategy together and then put yourself out there and share what you know and being very consistent, very consistent with your messaging. So if, if you want to get into productivity, that word has to be used in every single thing that you put out there so that people always think of you when they see that word. That's awesome advice. Daniel, I'm not sure if I totally understand your question, but he's asking, how have you established compelling event metrics in the past? Uh, maybe you want to unmute yourself. Oh, hey, Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. So I've produced a lot of events in the past, you know, and the challenge I have, especially in a nonprofit space, is that the metrics are really soft. And so you can spend a ton of time killing yourself to produce an event and then pat yourself on the back of how great it was. And then when you look at the bottom line, it really wasn't great at all. It was kind of a waste of time. So I'd love to just hear your kind of candid thoughts on that. So are you meaning like digital events for nonprofit? And well, I'm talking mostly, mostly live events in the past. I, I've found to be kind of a big waste of time, to be honest with you, especially if you want to make any money. Yeah. Um, they're, good, they're good to, you know, hobnob with people, but they're not, they're not strategy. They're, they're yeah. just, so, so that's, I'm just curious what you thought about that. Yeah. So we, we don't do a ton of nonprofit, but I will share with you what we have done. Whenever we've done a nonprofit event, and because I, I understand how important the data is, because the data drives the, the profit, um, every nonprofit event that we've been a part of, typically there are either one main sponsor that gives, that gifts the money to put on this phenomenal event. And then, but we also are very strategic. We're strategic in how we sell the tickets. We are strategic in making sure everything has a pixel code on it. <laughs> and so I'm a geek. And so what it really comes down to is, and especially for nonprofit events, whether it's going to be live or digital, you've got to look at the whole process of the strategy. How are we getting sponsors? How are we, what are we going to give them? But more importantly, what the heck are you going to track? 
So, and this is where people mess up with nonprofit. They, they plan, plan, plan. They're all excited about the beginning of the event. And then it's like, oh, the event went great. People showed up. They think they make money and you're exactly right. And then they go back, they look at their expenses and their overhead and they're like, well, shit, we, we didn't make any money. But what people are forgetting is the real work doesn't start until after the event. Because you've got to set up a nurturing campaign to nurture all of those sponsors, nurture all of the people that came, and then make sure that you're giving your sponsors some type of ROI where you're collecting the emails, you're asking the right questions. How can we stay in touch with you? Would you like a text message? Would you like an email? And, and so we build out a strategy for nurturing campaigns to make sure that you know, people come to nonprofit events, typically, typically they donate and they come because they have a personal, they have something personal with it. And so the last one we did was for narcolepsy. We ended up doing it five years in a row in Nashville and they, they own, there's only one narcolepsy medicine. And then ALS is another foundation that we get with nonprofit because of my sister. And so these things were very personal to me. But we make sure we are not doing the event unless it's going to be profitable. But again, you've got to make sure you're tracking. You've got to make sure you have a strategy for it. But it's the, it's the back end that people miss the opportunity, especially if you're going to do it over and over and over and over. And the number one thing that has always helped us set apart is you've got to involve the real people. Because a lot of these events, they're like, oh, we have a celebrity, Miley Cyrus, or oh, like I've, I've done a lot of country music artists weddings. And so people would hire me thinking that I'm just going to call them up and be like, hey, Hillary, hey, Jason, hey, so and so, like, can you come sing at this non -pro And no, it doesn't work like that. And I would never leverage that. I'm like, you don't need a celebrity to make money. Involve the real people. Why are they here? Let's, let's reach out and ask them their story. Let's get some professional video and run brand awareness ads around narcolepsy, which is some, some of what we did. But a lot of event planners, they don't have the marketing knowledge that we have gotten into over the years. And I mean, anything new that comes out, we're Facebook certified. We got TikTok certified. And so it's a whole piece that if you don't have a marketing company with a strategy helping the planner and, and collaborating, then you're right. There is no money at the end and people are in the black. So I think it's going to force us to look at nonprofit events, even in the future. And I mean, there's some other companies that I consulted with. There was a cow, the cowboy museum in Oklahoma. They wanted to do this huge art thing and digitally, they had no clue how to do it. And they don't usually make money, but it, it's making money for the artist and they just use their venue to do it. So there's a lot of different ways that people are going to get creative and they're probably going to seek out more marketing companies and that, we, that can collaborate with the planner. So I hope that helps. That's awesome. It's 104, so I don't want to go too over time, but maybe yes. one more. If someone has a pressing yeah, question, we we otherwise we can wrap up. Any final pressing questions, folks? And if y'all think of anything here, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, connect at Angela Profit to FCTGs.com. So if you guys have any questions or you think of something from today, or if you want the slide, shoot me an email and then we'll be sure to get back with you guys. You're awesome, Angela. And I always am like, okay, two F's and two T's because I always type it wrong the first time. Um, this has been incredible. Thank you for sharing your story. And thanks everyone for joining us. I hope to see you all sometime in person soon. Thanks for Bye. having me. Everybody Bye, have a great everyone. day.